So we're lucky enough today to be talking with Lawrence J. Wheeler, director of the North Carolina Museum of Art, before he runs away from us. But I'd like to ask what led you back from Cleveland to North Carolina back in 1994? You know, I'd been in North Carolina uh, prior to that as deputy secretary of the Department of Cultural Resources from 77 to 85, and then I went to Cleveland to be an assistant director of that great art museum and had a wonderful experience in Cleveland doing all the things that I enjoyed doing in North Carolina, which is opening cultural institutions up to the world around them. You know, I'm a, I'm a great believer in community and democratic access to the arts. And coming back to North Carolina, where I'd been before, and when that, this director's position opened up, I was all of a sudden interested because I was not director in Cleveland. This gave me the chance to head up one of the great cultural institutions of the Southeast and I saw enormous opportunity uh, to develop an institution I knew pretty well since I had been involved before I went to Cleveland, and then to return to a relatively new, prosperous, dynamic North Carolina and try to um, create awareness about the great uh, asset that was the North Carolina Museum of Art and its extraordinary collection and I saw opportunity to create programs around the museum that would engage and excite uh, the community of North Carolina. So North Carolina was the first state to dedicate money to the establishment of an art collection. It sometimes calls itself the state of the arts. Um, are they able to document that with this museum particularly? Well, you don't have to document it. You can document the fact that in 1947, uh, the General Assembly appropriated $1 million to begin a collection of art for the people of the state. That was unprecedented on any level for government to appropriate money for art. Taxpayers' money for art, yeah, how bold. Um, and then, of course, uh, there were other firsts. There was a symphony orchestra that was established even before the museum. And there was money from the state to have it tour around the state and to play in communities where school kids otherwise would not have access to classical music. It was great. Uh, this state eventually founded the first uh, school of the arts to be affiliated with the university system. It was one of the leaders in building the uh, Arts Council movement. Uh, there are a lot of rather noble um, initiatives that have happened in North Carolina. So yes, it can be called the state of the arts. So in your vision, you wanted to build this museum and you certainly have added tremendously to the collections. We are in the midst of one of them, the Rodin collection. How were you able to pull that off? Well, I danced with the right woman. Uh, I like to say, uh, Iris Cantor, who uh, she and her husband developed the largest collection of Rodin in private hands in the world, um, not counting the government of France, that's not so private, but uh, Bernie Cantor had uh, for years been collecting Rodin, having recasts of the great works of Rodin, and then giving them uh, to museum collections uh, all over the country. So when we wanted to do a big Rodin show in 2000, it only made sense that I had to meet Iris Cantor, and I did. I made arrangements to see her in New York, and actually asked, uh, made special requests for some exceptional works that were not in the uh, initial outline of the exhibition. And she promised me that she would get the monumental thinker uh, for the exhibition, which she did. And I said, you've got to be the chairman of our exhibition and come to the big party. And she hemmed and says, well, I don't do parties. And I said, oh, yes, you do, because I see your picture in the New York Times all the time. Anyway, she came to the opening, uh, declared it was one of the greatest parties she had ever attended in her life. And she and I were on stage dancing. It was a fantastic party. And we established a rapport and friendship that continued beyond the exhibition. And eventually I went to her and I said, Iris, you know, uh, we're building this new building and it's a great opportunity for you to think about giving some of your Rodins away. 
And uh, I have in mind that we could name a gallery for you and Bernie in the new building and a garden for outdoor pieces, which we have here. And, uh, and she said, well, it is the sweetest letter I've ever received, but I'm not saying yes yet. But I'm not saying no. And so we worked at it. And eventually she agreed to give 30 Rodin's to the North Carolina Museum of Art. And we agreed that we would create a beautiful environment for those works. And now, of course, it, it is uh, the largest, most comprehensive exhibition of Rodin east of Los Angeles and south of Philadelphia. And I always add, and that includes Texas. So it's really an important collection. It's great because it's here in the center of these universities that have access to it and to everybody uh, from far and wide who loves Rodin. So what other collections or particular pieces are you most proud of under your tenure? I'm proud of every single piece we've added to the collection. Um, I am really proud that we stepped up our commitment to collecting the underrepresented artists of the world. I felt that African American artists were woefully underrepresented in our collection, and it was, uh, and, and then of course, realizing that the best work being made in the world today, much of, it, uh, much of it was being made by African American artists. And when we did the 30 Americans exhibition some years back, and it was uh, 30 African American artists who were working in the world today, I was so impressed with the work and realized that very few of those artists were represented in our collection. So we set to work to change all of that. And we immediately went and acquired a great Mickalene Thomas, and uh, then Kahenda Wiley, and uh, Hank Willis Thomas, and on and on and on. So that today, I think we have a really strong representation, not only of African American artists, but Hispanic artists, and artists from throughout the world, Middle Eastern and uh, Asian as well. So we are aware of the changing demographics, and you did as I remember, a Latin American exhibition as well. Was that primarily to introduce the Latin American artists to the North Carolina collection or to introduce your audience to those artists? Well, it was more about the community. I realized that we had a, a growing uh, and important uh, Hispanic population in uh, the Triangle and in North Carolina. We have an embassy, a consulate from for Mexico here in uh, the community. I thought that we uh, were neglecting uh, a big part of our audience by not showcasing great work from, uh, from Latino artists. And so we had the opportunity to have that exhibition. And next year, of course, we're going to do Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera. And that's going to be a huge exhibition and will serve that same purpose. But everybody loves uh, those artists as well. When I say we, we do it to serve or to, to engage a particular cultural audience, that doesn't mean that we're not doing it for everybody to appreciate uh, the great voices of uh, beyond uh, our immediate environment. Well, you have had a really good program of acquisition, so one of my behind the scenes questions is what is the art to acquiring art? The art to acquiring art opportunity comes first because it's got to be available and you've got to have the money to afford it. And of course, we believe in collecting the very best. And so there is a certain connoisseurship that goes into the process. We want to add excellent works by whatever artist we choose to uh, acquire. And of course, we encourage people who have great collections to give works from their collections to the museum. We've had great success with that as well. You know, the Jim and Mary Patton collection of more than 100 works of uh, modernism and contemporary art, the extraordinary Ellsworth Kelly and Motherwells and Diebenkorns and Helen Frankenthal's, on and on and on. Those works that we could not have afforded, but they gave them all at one time because they had collected them over their lifetime. An extraordinary collection, and we have many examples of collectors who've chosen us as a repository for their collections. Well, people come here and they don't just look at things on the wall anymore. You have dance parties, you have brought in motorcycles, cars. I mean, what is going on? 
Well, everything is going on. You know, I think that, uh, you know, the uh, expanding the definition of what art is, uh, you know, an automobile represents extraordinary uh, design qualities, and particularly Porsche and the Art Deco automobiles that we had in an exhibition after Porsche. It not only was thrilling to see the, uh, the artistry in design, but it was a thrill to see all the new people come to appreciate that an art museum uh, appreciates some of the th same things they do. Now, you also have added films and, and concerts, and so what's a 21st century museum for an art museum anymore? A 21st century museum is about experiences, and it's about art, and who's to say that art only hangs on walls or is plopped down in certain places around and outside? No longer the case. Uh, art moves, it can be digital, it can be film, Art is meant to be heard in terms of the music, all kinds of music we're, which we're committed to presenting. And it's also about how those experiences, music, digital, video, dance, all expand the context of the art that we collect and have on the walls. And so each part informs the other and collectively creates this extraordinary energy uh, in the name of art. A great example being the You Are Here exhibition, which we completed um, recently, uh, which was an example of that, that you can bring music and video and uh, technology and, you know, all together. And some of the most popular art in the world today is about these digital experiences, Yayoi Kusama, for example, people line up around the blocks in, uh, in LA and New York to see Kasama. They lined up around the museum to see the Kasama here. The great thing is we made a commitment to acquire this Kasama for the permanent collection, which is my final acquisition for the collection and one I'm very proud of. It's by a 21st century artist, one of the most famous in the world, who happens to be Asian American, is a woman, and at this stage of her life is like 80 years old. So, uh, wow, great. And that's the sort of thing that we as a museum have become known for, taking bold initiatives in the name of the arts, whatever they may be. So you have drawn people from all over the country to see some of these exhibitions. How important is it to have the museum's stature and finances enhanced by these kind of mega traveling exhibits? Well, you know the answer to that. <laughs> it's important. The important thing, first of all, is to have great art and great exhibitions that engage the community and excite the community. It's a conversation. You have to, you can't be doing something just because it's intellectual or scholarly. You have to do something that people really, that connects with their souls, something they are aware of and want to be a part of. We've learned that to be true. And if we do it and engage our community in a profound way, it will engage all communities. So that when we do a big exhibition like Rodin or Monet or Rembrandt or uh, the Porsche show or you are I here. I love the fashion fair, I must say. And the Ebony show, man, that was so successful because all of a sudden the African-American community felt it was, the museum was theirs and it was about them. Yeah, it really, I was thrilling. But in terms of uh, national communities and, you know, we, we count the people who come and where they're from. I'm always determined that we're gonna have, first of all, somebody come from every one of the 100 counties in North Carolina, and they do every time. Every big exhibition, we get all 100 counties participating and all 50 states and many foreign countries. So with all of these big name exhibitions, we have a track record of doing exactly that. We get everybody, we get people from all over the United States, from all over North Carolina, and I like to say from all over the world. 
because what we do has energy. What we do has something that people want to be a part of at the North Carolina Museum of Art. And it's just great for the reputation of North Carolina. And it sort of fits with the dynamism around us and the economic growth of the state and the growing sophistication of the state and the, you know, the, the diversity, cultural diversity, it fits all of that. So do you find that you are indeed getting a more diverse population coming regularly? Yes. What is really thrilling to me, and I have broken into tears in certain speeches I make about this, but in, th in reflecting on my tenure as director, what, uh, what thrills me the most is when I can walk into these galleries in this building that I pretty much shaped and built, um, walk through these galleries and see people from every cultural background. And on any given day or weekend, I will see families of African Americans, not one or two, but many. I will see Hispanic families, I'll see Asian families, I will see families that are not rich, and I will see people all together enjoying um, their art in their art museum. That's thrilling to me because for so long, and it's still true today, art museums are white men's institutions. I should say white women's institutions. Uh, generally more women than men, but that is, you know, if I could do anything is to break that model, and I think we are breaking that model with the types of exhibitions we do, the types of concerts we present and films we present, and bit by bit, the entire community is taking ownership of this place, and they have great affection for this place. And because it's free to the public, they can come anytime they want, and they do. And that's what I'm most proud of. Well, you have a couple of major physical additions. Certainly this building is one, and the sculpture garden is the other. Um, when you set out in 1994, did you even have that on your long-range plan? <laughs> How do you have a, a long-range plan that embraces all those things you cannot possibly know? I knew that we were going to take advantage of every opportunity that we had. And I think part of the strength of my administration has been my very uh, cordial relationship with the state of North Carolina, with the Department of Cultural Resources, now Natural and Cultural Resources, and with the government, whatever, whether Democrat or Republican, we've been able to have close working relationships. So the resources we've needed have been there. And when the land became available around us, we were able to negotiate with a friendly government uh, to allocate it to us because they believed that we would honor it and make it worthwhile, create worthwhile experiences for the people. And we have done that. And I think it's not only the state, but our relationship with city and county government and with federal governments. But it's not just government. I think it's important to have a positive, supportive, uh, relationship and money coming from those sources, what I'm really proud of is that we've created a pub strong public-private partnership so that the private side has risen to the occasion and surpassed the public investment in what we get in this museum. Uh, when I started, it was 70% funded by the state and 30% funded by private resources. Uh, for a long time, it, was, it turned to be 70% private and 30% state. And now we're at about a 60-40 relationship, 60 private, 40 state. And I think it should, the burden should always be borne by the private sector, primarily. I think that is the margin of excellence and the dynamism that uh, we enjoy as a cultural institution. And as we go forward, we will see, but I will not be here to do it. <laughs> I think um, an online magazine insider said that this museum was one of the top 25 in the, in the U.S. In the art world generally, how would you say this museum is considered? It's considered as an important museum. Certainly the collection, for those who know it, recognize it as one of the great European art collections in the United States. I would say that uh, in, uh, you know, now our modern contemporary collections uh, are well known. We're one of the great collecting institutions in the world of contemporary art, probably among the best, certainly in the southeastern United States. It's considered, like along with the Virginia Museum and the High, to be 
uh, the leading museums of the, of the Southeast. We all have our distinctions, who's better, who's best. But we're among the leading museums of America because not only the collections, but our program and uh, the way that we have engaged our community and our campus and the multiplicity of experiences that we create here. So we have been an innovator among museums and that is now finally uh, coming to light and being recognized. So aren't you also engaged with recruitment as all these industries and people come into the state? How are you involved in that? Well, I believe we should always be at the table and um, I've always believed that. I push myself to the table, uh, whether it's the Convention and Visitors Bureau, and I was on the board there for a while, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce, whether it's individual industries recruiting uh, businesses. I've always wanted us to be um, a showcase for the community, and we've encouraged them to do events here and to uh, particularly for economic developers, for any national associations coming to town, do your event at the museum because it leaves such a strong impression with the visitors. So we always want to be a partner in whatever advances uh, the economic life of the community and the quality of life uh, perceptions in the community. So what's ahead for this museum? Great things, uh, more greatness for sure. You know, I think it will always connect with the uh, the rhythms of the uh, this uh, world of North Carolina and the Research Triangle region as we're facing extraordinary economic growth and population growth. We're already established as the one of the go-to places. We're sort of at the center of the conversation about the type of growth that happens around us. I was recently at the annual luncheon for the Convention and Visitor Bureau and they uh, unveiled their strategic plan and in the 10 points that they want to achieve in the next five to 10 years, it was clear that the museum was at the center of three or four of those. Uh, quality of life, uh, destination marketing, et cetera. It will continue to be that, I'm glad that now finally people are aware that the arts really do uh, make a difference and they are not set-asides. So people are properly proud of the museum now? They should be and they are, yes. So what's ahead for Lawrence J. Wheeler? Lawrence J. Wheeler will continue to be Lawrence J. Wheeler. I will continue to be a cheerleader uh, for this museum and for the arts and for museums generally. And uh, you know, I, 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 w I look forward to helping um, organizations other than this museum uh, solve problems and uh, become better at what they do. So is there anything more you would add that I have not touched on? Well, you've touched on a lot. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to discuss the museum. I think that uh, the, the Department of Cultural Resources is an extraordinary um, example of what North Carolina's core values are, uh, what it is truly committed to, preserving its history and making sure that the libraries are uh, resources that are connected to people's lives and that the arts, all of them, the symphony and the arts councils and theater and that everyone has access to that and that we honor our artists. And I'm really keen on the fact that we should make them know that they are the great voices of our lives. Well, those of us who've been here for a while have been amazed and impressed by what you have been able to do, and we all sincerely thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs>